Hello, thank you all for joining us today. And thank you to Barnes and Noble for hosting us. I am so excited for Chain of Thorns to come out tomorrow. Like you, I have loved Cassie's writing from the very first book, City of Bones, and I am perpetually in awe of how Cassie is able to deliver greatness again and again, book after book. Chain of Thorns is no exception. This will be a spoiler-free event, so I won't ask any questions or say anything revealing, but I will say I just finished Chain of Thorns and it was everything I hoped it would be with the perfect ending. Just to give you an idea of how things will go tonight, I will first introduce myself and Cassie and then ask a few questions of my own before I turn to the Q&A. Uh, bear in mind that um, your books with signed book plates will be mailed after the event and you can expect them in eight to 10 business days. Please also note that the chat will be off for the event, but the Q&A is open and you can post questions and upvote other questions. This event will last until 8 p.m. My name is Marie Rutkowski. I'm the New York Times bestselling author of several fantasy books for children and young adults, including The Winner's Curse, um, and most recently, The Forgotten Gods Duology, which starts with The Midnight Lie. I'm also a professor of English at Brooklyn College um, and the author of a novel for adults called Real Easy, which was named a New York Times best crime novel of 2022. Cassie uh, needs no introduction. She's the winner of several awards, has been a number one New York Times and number one Publishers Weekly bestselling author many times over, as well as a USA Today bestseller. Her books have been sold, uh, her books have sold more than 50 million copies worldwide and have been translated into more than 35 languages. She is also super smart and funny and has a heart of gold. Chain of Iron is her latest novel, the third and final book in the Last Hours trilogy. She also will have a delicious fantasy novel for adults coming for us soon called Swordcatcher. But for now, let's dive into Chain of Iron. Uh, Cassie, I know that you research your books meticulously. Um, could you tell us what was so um, special about Edwardian England that you really wanted to highlight when writing these books? I'm a big historical fiction fan. I feel like it's the closest thing we have to time travel, you know, and get the real sense from a book of what the past felt like and smelled like and sounded like and was like um, is a great feeling. So um, my, I've always thought of like my favorite period as being around the Victorian era, you know, Dickens type in um, London. And so that's what I did for Infernal Devices. Um, and then I started thinking about um, like, what if I wanted to write a book about the kids of the Infernal Devices characters? And I started looking into what that would mean time period wise. And I found myself really fascinated by the Edwardian period because it's this real transition from into sort of what we think of as modern day, like in just that 25 years gap between Infernal Devices and Last Hours, we start to have electric lights, we have telephones, cars, and all of this stuff that's sort of what we think of as like the modern world, but it's all very new and exciting to them. Um, I don't think this is the biggest spoiler. There's like a, the, the Institute gets a telephone in uh, Chain of Thorns, but Will can only use it by yelling really loudly into it because he doesn't really understand how it works. <laughs> so, um, so all this stuff is very new and exciting and the Chain of Iron for everybody who's read it, um, you know, Matthew and Cordelia go on this car trip and it was really funny to plan out the car trip because I wanted them to go to a certain location, but cars at that time only went like 10 miles an hour. <laughs> So I had to factor in how long it was going to take to get there, which was much longer than I thought. Um, so uh, it's, it's just a really, to me, interesting period. And it's also this sort of last sort of piece of this kind of particular age um, of Englishness that happens before World War I. World War I really comes along and just changes everything. Nothing in England is ever the same again after, after that first World War. Um, and so uh, it was interesting to write about just that sort of period between like just before everything changes, modern warfare is sort of born and 
um, the world like politically and socially and economically just completely transforms. Yeah, I mean, that's so fascinating to hear. I also was thinking as I read the book um, and as I was listening to you speak just now that Edwardian England might represent an interesting time as well, morally or socially, you know, as a kind of transition between what people thought was okay before and what is okay then, and maybe as a bridge to modernity, um, possibly in the same way that electricity and telephones are. And, you know, one of the things I have always um, really appreciated about your books is how you've been representing queer characters so wonderfully um, and so well from the very beginning. Um, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how you dealt with um, that representation and the homophobia of the time that you were writing about um, and maybe some of the relationships as much as you can without giving Without spoiling. Time. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I mean, there's, I feel like there's often very little queer representation in historical fiction, I think, because people because people either don't want to deal with the homophobia of the time period or because they think that there isn't much written about, you know, queer life in that time period. But there's actually a lot, you know, so I read a lot of books about I was really fascinated, but specifically by an artist named Romaine Brooks who um, dressed in men's clothes and painted self-portraits of herself as a man. You know, she took women as lovers. She, you know, had this sort of fascinating life. And so once I learned about her, I thought, well, what was her life like? You know, I mean, we think of, of that time period as being, you know, extremely repressive, extremely homophobic, but here's all these stories of her going out in society, being like a toast of society and a darling and, you know, traveling to Paris and meeting with Colette, who also had a lover who was a woman who wore men's clothes. Um, and so sort of diving into that stuff, I, you know, found that sort of fascinating. Well, I think the fact that if, um, on one hand, if you have enough money, you can do almost anything. <laughs> I was like, oh, actually, um, there, there's quite a bit about, uh, about queer, you know, life in that time period, but does does tend to focus on people of upper classes as they were fairly untouchable. Um, and I also learned a lot about how, I mean, being a gay man was illegal at that point in England. Um, being a lesbian was not, um, because the, the, the stories that Queen Victoria refused to believe that lesbians existed. She was like, well, that's not a thing. So it never was <laughs> illegal. I don't know if that's true, but apocryphally, that's the tale. And so one, so there was an actual, you know, lesbian life of nightclubs and meetings. And, you know, it still had, was existed, you know, below the radar because there was still, you know, the opprobrium of society and whatnot, but women did live together and, you know, um, were actually somewhat freer to express that sexuality than men were. Men went to France. In France, it was not illegal to be gay. And so that's why there's so many references in the books to Paris and Matthew going to Paris and Alistair and Thomas going to Paris and whatnot is this sort of idea of like, Paris, France as a place you can be free, you can be, you know, your authentic self and um, also had this big, had a, a lively gay nightlife, um, which I had a lot of fun researching all of these like amazing different sort of themed clubs and, and whatnot. Um, so yes, and then also I'm dealing with, um, at the same time, this subculture of shadow hunters and what's their view. So it's certainly in, in the books, I think, you know, we have the char characters, Thomas and Alistair, who are afraid to come out. We have Anna who just came out and was like, this is me, deal with it. Um, so the shadow hunters have a slightly different attitude, I think, than they would if they were mundanes, but we do still have, you know, see the characters being worried about coming out, not because of dealing with legality as they might if they were mundanes, but of a dealing with what or how are their parents going to react? How is how is society as a group going to react? How is their like tight knit community going to react? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, even, um, you know, the, the straight characters still have to deal with the mores of the time. I mean, it, can I say something about the end of book two? Or is that? Yeah. No, I think book yeah. two and book one are fair game. 
Okay. All right. Great. Yeah, because I was going to mention um, how you know Cord- Cordelia has to have a fake marriage because mm-hmm. she steps out of line in terms of what her society feels is acceptable. I mean, did did you have fun as well playing with some of some of what was done and not done in Edwardian times for everybody? I mean, not just not just queer people, but straight people as well. Yeah, I mean, women obviously, you know, are treated differently than men. And we see that in Cordelia, you know, knows when she's about to stand up and say that she spent the night with James, that this is the end for her life. Like, you know, this is it. She's never going to be accepted into polite society again. Nobody's going to want to marry her. She's going to have to go live on a country estate and like feed geese or something. Like she knows what she's <laughs> giving up. And she knows that if James did the same thing, he wouldn't be giving up anything because there's no judgment of a man who has sex before marriage, but there's an enormous judgment of a woman who does that. So I did have, I mean, I had fun with it in the sense that um, I really love a fake marriage trope. (laughs) I always wanted to do it. And I was always like, well, in YA, you don't see that that much because, you know, these characters are younger, they're unlikely to get married. And I was like, ah, but in historical and in this specific situation, you know, I can have this sort of like, you know, reason why they need to get married. And that was a lot of fun. Yeah, I love the torture of it too. I mean, you know me, I love an angsty love. Yes, <laughs> I know you do. You're like, more pain, more pain. <laughs> but I love it because she loves him and she's married to him, but she thinks it's not real. Um, yeah, All right. and so just this, this segues really nicely to my next question, which is, um, has to do with the way you're always crossing us. You're always writing such torturous um, love crosses in your book. You're so good at it. Um, And I just wondered what, do you just like torturing us or is there another reason why you like to just throw some spanners in the works of romance? Torturing the characters, it's it's not really. (laughs) It's not personal. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I mean, it's a little bit like, oh, you know, I do sometimes think like, oh, I wonder how, you know, readers will react to this. And, you know, definitely there's, there's, there's an aspect of that. But I also, I like a love that's very hard one, you know, that like, it's not easy to, uh, ac- to get to the end of with that love. It's not easy to accomplish that love, that that love has been really fought for. And that that often requires a certain amount of torment and tension and uh, you know I love I like seeing you know people driven to really extremes of their feelings because of how intense this love is you know that like that's part of like showing how how I think you know big you know this this feeling of love is is how much the how much pain is caused like when Alec and Magnus break up how much you know pain and torment they feel, um, you know, reflect so much they love each other or when T- Tessa has to tell Will that she can't marry him because she's already marrying Jem. Um, I wrote that scene over and over and over again and I kept giving it to Holly, Holly Black, because she was with me and being like, does this is sad? Does it make you cry? Is it painful? And it's like 11, you know, drafts. She was like, it's so painful, stop making me <laughs> <laughs> Oh. <laughs> well, that that rings true. That rings, you know, that that or he checks out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, well, so you know, even when we're not talking about romance, I feel, I feel like a lot of crying emojis over in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do see them, like the the weeping. Mm-hmm. Um, but I also see the hearts. They love the tears, as That's do right. I. So. Um, Romance aside, or I mean, we can still talk about romance, but I, I do want to talk about how, how you're so um, amazing at just representing characters working through difficult things, like not just in you know, the pain of love that doesn't go the way you want it to, but also like living with a mistake or living with loss, living with disappointments. Um, Why do you think it's important to show that in books and maybe even particularly in YA books? I think specifically in YA books, but in general, I mean, I think 
for me, I love a flawed character, you know? Um, and I think a lot of readers do too. Um, I think we love a character with nuance, you know? It's very rare to find a character who is always good, always right, you know? Um, because people aren't like that. And ditto, even the bad characters are rarely, unless they're demons or some supernatural creature, human beings that are bad people are still usually don't think of themselves as bad people. Rarely do people think I'm going to do this. And you know, you run across this in in badly written stuff or TV shows that, you know, where the character where the, the villain is basically like, I am a villain because I am evil. I enjoy doing evil. And I'm going to blow up the earth because I am evil, even though I am on earth and it's where I keep my stuff. It's inconvenient for me, but I'm gonna do it anyway. Because I love evil. And you're left thinking like, why? Like, rather than being like afraid of this person, you're left thinking, why are they doing this? I don't, you know, it doesn't com compute to me that, that, that they would behave like this. So I feel like there's a real value in showing characters who have nuance, who make mistakes and come to live with those mistakes because we all do. And I think, you know, also when you're young, you know, sometimes you're going through the times that you've made your first big mistakes or, you've done something, you know, that you regret and whatnot. And I think it's useful to see in fiction that that's not the end of your life. Everybody makes mistakes and we make up for them, you know, in the best ways that we can. Um, and we also learn to accept out that other people make mistakes, you know? That first time that you have a fight with a friend when you're young and you have to learn how to forgive, you know, because you always do, because people are always gonna screw up. They're always going to, mess up in some way, disappoint you in some way. And I think that especially for girls and women, there's a real value in seeing um, on the page, you know, girls um, who make mistakes, who screw up, even screw up really big time and are still heroines. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so as you know, I'm, I'm a bit of a nerd um and <laughs> especially about books and I love Dickens I think you love Dickens I wondered if you could talk about why why Dickens became so important for this series I think there's something about the way Dickens writes about love that's always really gotten to me it's always I mean you know um angsty love he's actually really great at. I went through a period of reading all of Dickens and, you know, um, Tale of Two Cities, you know, is an amazing angsty love story of a man who knows that he is not a good man and is in love with this woman who he knows or he believes he will never be good enough for. And he makes this final extremely grand gesture of sacrifice in order to save the man that she loves. You know, that's a far, far better thing I do than I have ever done before is from the end of Tale of Two Cities. And um, so I remember reading that and just crying and crying when I was a kid. I was so sad that this thing had happened. And then I went on to read Great Expectations, which is in its own way, like an even more complicated love story because it's sort of about how we love um, our imagined, sometimes our imagination of what someone is more than what they actually are. But, you know, story of Pip who falls in love with Estella he never really knows her like he loves her because she is unknowable to him and he imagines this Estella that may or may not be the real Estella and we never really do get to know the real Estella it's always sort of the mystery of of the book um but the things that the way he talks about her um the way he talks about his feelings of love for her were just I think some of the most some of the most beautiful writing that Dickens has done um and so I remember that really moved me and um even the story of Miss Havisham and her incredibly disappointed love and how he took off on their wedding day and so she never changed in out of her wedding dress and she never she left the wedding cake to rot on the table and all that you know um is such a I don't know it's such a specifically like tragic uh you know, concentration on a certain kind of obsession with love, you know? I mean, could she have been happy after that? Sure, she could have changed out of the wedding dress. She could have thrown away the cake and she could have started her life over, but she preferred to fixate on this, you know, um, sort of imagined great love. 
and the tragedy of her having lost it. And so there was always, so there's something really fairy tale like about great expectations that has always fascinated me. You know, the cursed sort of haunted manner in the woman who never, you know, wears her bloody wedding dress, the, you know, Pip um, sort of as the peasant and Estella as the princess. And so I felt like there was something really fun about sort of reimagining that with sort of um, James as Pip and Grace as Estella, except we do kind of get to know Grace better than I think we do get, than we get to know Estella. Um, and she is nothing like the person James imagined that she was. Yeah, I think there's something Dickensian too about your books and how intricate they are. I mean, there's so many different characters, so many relationships, so much that happens. Um, you know, it's really like Dickens's books, your books are chock full of events and people. Um, so I'm gonna ask one final question and then we'll turn it over to the Q&A. Um, I, you know, your one of the hallmarks I think of your writing is just um, is is not just the romantic relationships which you do so well, you know, but also relationships between siblings or between friends. Um, and it's just your world is so rich with really um, nuance, as you said earlier, people, but also relationships. Um, and so, Maybe this isn't fair to ask, but do you have a favorite relationship or a couple favorite relationships that um, that you crafted during the books? And it doesn't have to be romantic. It can be any kind of relationship. I mean, it's hard to pick one. Um, I love Jim and Will. I really love that relationship that uh, really was born out of my thinking about um, will and his curse and what it would mean to because I, I came up with will just you know usually I come up with the characters first and I remember thinking about will and thinking that he had this curse anybody he loved would die because I was thinking about it in a romantic context of him like pushing Tessa away and uh then I thought well how how could he possibly ever have a friendship with anyone how could he have a relationship with anyone and I was like if they were dying then he could have a relationship with someone. And so there's this real complexity of Will's love of Jem. He loves him, you know, very, very, you know, intensely. And also he knows his love is dependent on the fact that Jem is going to die. So he feels guilt about that. And in the meantime, you know, Jem loves Will um, and yet also knows that there are ways in, that there are things about Will he doesn't know, that Will has this secret that he's keeping that no one knows. Um, um, but how devoted they are to each other and how they would, you know, die for each other is I feel like, you know, sort of a, a ideal of friendship mm -hmm. that I really love. Like this sort of, you know, spiritual bond that is a bond above all other things. Yeah, I love that relationship too. Also, the, the flow of hearts that came up um, suggests that it is. And other people also like it. Yay! <laughs> yeah. Okay. So we'll turn now to the Q and A. Um, everyone, please be patient with me while I'm scrolling through the questions, um, because there are many of them. Um, okay. Um, let's see the. Like the top question here is, hi, Cassie. This is from Kayla Miller. I've been reading your books since The Mortal Instruments and have been such a big fan. What has been your favorite series to write or favorite book? Um, it's a really hard question because I do love all of them sort of equally in different ways. Um, I really loved writing Clockwork Princess. I think um, there's, there is a lot of pain and angst in it. <laughs> so I really got to enjoy all of that. But there are also just a lot of some of, of my favorite sort of, it was, it's like a collection of a, my favorite, you know, tropes and, and, and romance bits and angsty stuff. And it's just, it was really like, a, I had a really good time writing it. Um, so I guess I'd pick that one, but it's really, I don't know if I have a favorite. This is a fun question. Um, if you could go on a weekend long trip with any one of the Mary Thieves, 
who would it be? Oh man. Um, I mean, Matthew, he seems like he'd be the most fun, you know, like I'd like him to go to, I mean, Cordelia and Matthew go to Paris and Chain of Thorns, we all know that. And he sort of shows her around town. And I feel like, you know, I would like to go to Paris with Matthew and have him show me around town because he seems to know a lot of really interesting places <laughs> that I don't know about. <laughs> so I would, I would pick Matthew. That's a fun question. Yeah, great answer too. Um, Victoria Johnson would like to know, how do you feel about being one book closer to the end of the Shadowhunter Chronicles ending for good? That's very dark, Victoria. <laughs> very dark way of thinking about things. <laughs> Um, I try not to think about it too much. Um, it freaks me out because um, I've sort of lived with these characters for like 17 years, something like that. Um, I try to sort of, con I mean, there definitely was a strange feeling, you know, when I was done with Chain of Thorns and I was like, okay, you know, off it goes. So that's a, that's a full, you know, uh, trilogy finished and there's only one more, uh, Week of Powers. And so I, you know, I do remember feeling very sort of unsettled um, I try to focus on being excited about writing Wicked Powers and the fun things that are going to happen in it and, you know, the excitement of wrapping up, you know, cert, uh, you know certain plot lines that have, even the ones that have gone on for a really long time, things we, there are sort of mysteries in the series, things we know, things we don't know, uh, mystery of Kit's powers, like who's going to end up with the fairy throne, uh, what's, what's going on in, in Idris right now, now that, you know, they can't get into it. Um, so I'm excited about that and I try to focus on that and not so much on the ending. Um, I don't know if you can answer this question, um, but Crystal Freitas would like to know whether you can tell us the working titles for the Wicked Powers books. Ooh, <laughs> no, I definitely can't. Okay. <laughs> I know what they Here, are. I know what they are, but they're like, they're all, I'm not going to see they're huge spoilers they're kind of spoilery they're very different than any other titles that I've done um but I would be murdered by my by the publisher of Wicked Powers if I were to reveal the titles before they got a chance to do it okay then don't I can't <laughs> um, but I do, I do know what they are <laughs> um there are some questions that are a little spoilery or asking for spoilers so I'm going to um I'm going to skip to one from Kim Cooper um Geigerich who is asking without spoilers what part of the book are you most excited for us to read and why oh um hmm I'm trying to think um because there's a bunch of different parts that I'm excited for people to read um Man, these I'm bad at I'm bad at favorites questions. <laughs> um, I'm excited for people to the Paris part, but that's just because I really love Paris and I think that there's a really fun scenes in the Paris part and um it's a fun demon battling and some very angsty angst. So I will leave it at that. It's very angsty, angsty business in a fancy hotel. Mm. Amazing. Um Lauren Hughes would like to know if Church will get his own book or novella. Lauren says, I want to hear about his travels from the warlocks who had him to Jem to Jace to Emma. Oh my God, that would be so funny. Um, I mean, I feel like it would be very short. <laughs> I don't think that he, I'm not, I think he'd just be like, where are the people who open cans for me? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he loves Jem, so he would spend a lot of time being like, who's that? Not Jem. Um, otherwise, he would just be like, you know, every, you know, everyone has gone out carrying weapons. There is no one here to open canes for me. You know, I know they have to save the world, but other things are more important, like feeding the cat. I mean, I got cats. I know what they think about. It's mostly, you know, food. <laughs> when will they get food? Why are they not getting food right now? <laughs> So that sounds to me like a maybe, like maybe. I mean, you know, I could see maybe a pamphlet or something, you know, city of church, something like that, you know, church, you know, uh, I mean, maybe like a demon breaks into the Institute while everybody else is out and church defeats them, but no one ever knows it was him. He doesn't really get the credit. <laughs> great, great. 
Um, Cass Fox asks, can you give us a peek into your writing process? Do you map out all the events in the whole series first and then write the individual books? There's so many cool connections across all the generations and timelines. Um, my writing process is kind of nuts. Maria's seen some of it. Um, it involves a lot of, I think I'm keeping the post-it, you know, industry of America in business. Um, <laughs> So because of the way that Shadowhunters works and this, how many books there are, how many details and bits of you know, unfinished business that are you know, meant to continue on, it's a very like um, structured process. So usually what I'll do is I'll write down, I'll, I'll use either post-its or pieces of paper, write, write down scenes um, and so that they can be kind of modular and I'll move them around until in order and once they're in order I'll move to Google slides and I'll start putting them into the slides so that we have all the scenes and then I can see how many scenes there are and in what order and I'll often split them up into different um, plot lines so like I'll be like this is the you know Cordelia plot line this is the Lucy and Jesse plot line this is the Anna and Ariadne plot line and they get you know separate sections so I can read them through as if they were just their own book and going you know that every section has to have its own arc and resolution and then sort of cut them together um, with the overall like sort of action and um, mystery plot. So it's a lot of, a lot of outlining work. Um, I've written outlines that are 60,000 words long, like, you know, it's very long, long outline, um, just to have a sort of sense of the skeleton of the book and you know, whether, whether it works and whether, you know, it's structured and the pacing works, you know, properly that way. Um, so I do usually do that with the Shadowhunters books. With Swordcatcher, I did that a little bit less because it's the first book and it's much more about introducing people to a world. So I had much more um, of a, I did not do the same kind of thing with scenes and like um, incredibly detailed outline, I did a timeline instead. So I did the very, I did a timeline so that I knew where the characters were at any point in the story. So the timeline was sort of like, this is the tale, you know, this is the, the mystery and the, you know, magic and the whatnot and where is everybody at each point in the story. So it was a different kind of structural thing. I love Sir Kenny. I mean, lo love Chain of Thorns, love Swordcatcher. Um, I'm excited for everybody in the audience to read these books. Um, so Cameron Carter has a question that was related to the last one. Um, she was, it's a specific one. Uh, Cameron um, would like to know, how does Grace Blackthorn connect to the current Blackthorns like Julian and Helen? Uh, I can't really tell you that. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I should. Sorry. I, should know. I, Sorry. Know, I know. We do. We we do not yet know. There'll probably be one day a correct family tree. Okay. Um, what songs from the Chain of Thorns playlist have a specific chapter attached to it? Oh man, I'd have to go look at the Chain of Thorns playlist. Um, it's not really generally that they have a specific chapter attached to them. I'm looking to see if I can find it on my phone because. I unwisely totally failed to bring my um, computer with me on, the, on my door, so I'm on my iPad. Um, it rarely is it that the that there's like a chapter that the um, that the songs have to do with, but usually they have to do with um, a character or a feeling or like a piece of the plot. So I use it as a kind of a sense memory device, like. If there's a fight scene or something like that, then I will pick, you know, try generally try to find a song um, that makes me feel kind of like pumped up and energetic and whatnot. Um, okay, so I can think of one song. Um, Taylor Swift's Gold Rush mm. is um, the song that I think of when I think of the scene where James leaves um, Cordelia alone on the dance floor. Such a heartbreaking scene. Yeah, I felt so bad for her. Yeah. And I was like, oh man, being humiliated in public. What a jerk that guy is. I know, I know. <laughs> it also feels, you know, that's another one of those moments that makes me think about the history too of the of the world you've created because it's even worse then 
than it would be now to be left oh, alone. Oh, yes. Well, it's interesting because I was thinking like about Emma and the book Emma, and there's a scene where Mr. Knightley leads Harriet into, um, yes. into the dining room, and it's this moment where uh, he saves her from humiliation. You know, it's this moment of, that shows us what a good person he is, makes kind of makes Emma fall more in love with him. That's what I would call like social saving. And I was like, what is the opposite of that? Because yeah. I wanted James to do something really terrible because we needed to, to kind of see the manner in which what we would find out was the bracelet was making him do things he would not normally do. Yeah. Um, let's see. Um... Ava Day. Ava Day's birthday is today. Happy birthday. Yeah. So Ava Day is asking which last hour's book is your favorite? Um, and which book in the Shadow Hunters Chronicles is your favorite? And do you have a least favorite? I don't know if you want it. I mean, I'm sure that they're all your babies and that yeah, they're like favorite. They are like all your children. So you rarely look back on them and think like that one's just a dead, you know? <laughs> um, I think, I mean, I think Chain of Thorns is my favorite. It was, you know, I really like third books, you know, I'm almost always, you know, in a series, if someone asks me what my favorite is, I'll generally tend to pick the last book because I love, you know, the writing the resolution, wrapping up mystery, what not I always have the most trouble with first books where I'm like establishing the relationships in the world and how it works um they're they're fun in their own way but they're also and, and other people feel completely differently like I know that like I have friends who love the first book hate the third book love the second book hate the other books it's really uh, depends on you and how you you know like to how you like to write what you know you feel the most comfortable with you know, the first book is an intro to the world. The second book raises the stakes, you know, really, you know, makes you understand like what's, you know, at stake in this story and what needs to be resolved. And then hopefully the third book resolves those things. So I would say a chain of thorns. And then, sorry, what was that? Oh, do I have a least favorite book? I don't know, the Shadowhunters Codex. That's my least favorite. I don't think that there's anything wrong with it, but you know, there's no story. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Um, okay, uh, Maria Kessner um, says, oh, I just lost that one. Where did it go? Maria, Maria. Kessner, there it is. Okay. Um, how did you approach writing the love triangle with Matthew, James, and Cordelia to ensure you told a different pair of love triangle than Jem, Will, and Tessa? I mean, I think you'll see a lot of that in the third book, the way in which it's different. Um, I wanted to come at, I mean, I wanted to come at it in a very different way um, in the sense that, I mean, I'm trying to think of ways to talk about this that aren't too spoilery. I know. Sure. I know. Um, in that it is something that, uh, well, for one thing, Will and Jim never even found out that the other one liked Tessa until the very, very, very end of the last book. If you, you may not remember, but they, neither of them knew um, for an incredibly long time. And in this one, James does know and Matthew does know pretty much the all of Chain of Thorns. And they have to kind of work that out and, and live with it. Um, and, and because also because what is going on with James and Matthew already is that they're keeping these sort of big secrets from each other. And so this is just another complicating factor. In some ways it serves to kind of break open all of those secrets and force them to talk and to confront them. Um, Gem and Will had and Tessa are a love triangle where everybody loves each other equally. And I would not say the same about James and Matthew and Cordelia you'll have to wait and find out. This question is also, I really want to know the answer to it myself, um, but it's also, I don't know if you can answer this one without spoiling it, but maybe if you can't answer it in terms of chain of thorns, you could answer it in terms of chain of iron. Okay. Um, someone is asking what the hardest thing to write in chain of thorns was. Hmm. Um, yeah, I probably can't say, huh? Um, 
I mean, I guess I will, well, okay, I'll say there is a, there is a, a death in Chain of Thorns and it's not writing the death I have discovered over the time of the time I have been writing. It's not writing the scene where someone dies. That's difficult. It's writing everyone's feelings afterwards because when you are grieving, your brain is scrambled. You know, the way that you think and react to things is completely off kilter. And so writing a character who is grieving intensely is sort of like trying to ride a bucking bronco. So there is a section of the book, which if you have looked on my Instagram, I put up the chapters. There's one called Intermission Grief. And it is sort of the story of how that grief is dealt with. Um, and before I didn't come up with the intermission idea instantly. I had to go through a couple of attempts of trying to write what it was like for these characters to who are still alive to feel that grief and deal with it. And it was incredibly hard to, to do that. And I suddenly thought, well, what if I sort of set this off from the rest of the book and write it in a slightly different style so that that style kind of expresses, you know, what it is to feel grief that way, this grief that feels like you've been dropped down into the bottom of a well. Um, and so that was uh, a really difficult part of the book to, to write. I had to try it a couple of times before I came up with a solve. And, uh, and I noticed that many people got very scared that there was a section called intermission grief, which I understand. <laughs> Or like, wow, it's like, actually, you're like, okay, I got to stop, put the book down, uh, get some stuff in order to, in order to deal with this. So it's more, I meant it more as an intermission from the characters, but you can treat it as an intermission for you if you want to. <laughs> um, Joanna Goodall asks, when you mentioned how England was changed after World War I, it made me start to wonder. How do you think war, specifically World War I, since it happens soon after the last hours, affected shadow hunters? I mean, I try to keep them out of mundane wars just because the idea of them becoming involved in them seems to me so complicated and difficult and that there would be no way for that to happen without changing the outcomes of wars. And especially when you get into later wars or when you get into World War II, you know, I'm like, oh, I can't. That. Like it's too, there's something about the idea of involving them in real world, terrible tragedy that I don't feel comfortable with. Mm -hmm. um, I do think of course that the things that change, you know, um, the way that the mundane world works affect them as well. Um, so, I mean, World War One changed um, sort of the way things were made, manufacturing jumped up because as it always does when there's war because things are manufactured for war and then turned over to civilian purposes. Um, a generation of, of men died, you know, an uncountable number of, of, of British young men died in World War I. So that enormous loss um, would have been felt throughout the country and I'm sure they would also feel it. Um, and it changed the way, and as often happens in war, it changed the way that women were active in society because, you know, just like in, in World War II where you get like Rosie the Riveter, you have women suddenly moving more into the workforce and doing these jobs because there are no men around to do them. So I remember there's a really, uh, there's a Doctor Who episode. I don't remember what it's called, but uh, Doctor Who and Martha are at a boarding school in something like, you know, 1905. It's pretty close to the time of the um, of the last hours. And I just remember there are these boys in the boarding school. One of them says something um, rude to Martha and she kind of turns around and looks at them and says under her breath, you'll all be dead in 10 years. Oh, yeah. And I was like, yeah, they all will. Like the number of people who died in that war is is unbelievable. So I can't imagine that it wouldn't affect them. Maybe not in the same way that it affects mundanes, but I can't imagine they wouldn't be affected. Yeah. Um, so Kai or, or Kaj, forgive me everyone if I'm mispronouncing people's names. Um, Kai Jensen asks a really fun question, uh, which is at one point, James very emphatically shouts that he loves tea. What is his favorite tea? 
Um, mm, I don't, let me think. I was gonna say Lao Tseng Sushan because it smells like smoke and tar. I hate it, but the people who love it really love it. Have you ever had it? I have, I don't like it either. Yeah, I know. It's like drinking a forest fire. Right, I know. Who okay. likes it? And my mom really likes it. And I'm always like, this is like drink. It smells like a tire fire. So yeah. I, you know, but Maria and I have a much more similar taste in tea. We like our tea to be, to taste like cake. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I would probably say, um, yeah, I'm going to give him Lao Tseng Sushan because he's tough and he spends a lot of time hanging out in demon worlds. I think he would like it. Great. Um, okay, let's see. Um, ooh, Natasha Eldridge would like to know. I don't know if you can answer this, but it's not a spoiler. I don't think. Will we get a series about the circle, specifically Valentine and Jocelyn? I really thought about doing one, um, and it was even had a name. It was called The Secret Treasons. Um, and I had so many other projects to do that I realized that there was no way I was going to be able to do it. Um, I, I thought, you know, I will do this in my free time and then realized I had no free time. Um, so I sort of put it on the back burner. So it does exist in sort of an outline -y format. So there's always the possibility I will do it at some point in the future. Mm. Exciting. I do like a, I like a prequel about, you know, a bunch of people who are about to do something really dangerous, bad. <laughs> Um, Courtney would like to know, and this question I think could apply to any book pre Chain of Thorns. Um, what has been the hardest character death for you? Um, well, I mean, up to Chain of Thorns. Um, I mean, I'm, <laughs> I think Livy was the hardest. Um, a lot of people want me to say Will, and I understand that, but Will died when he was like 85, surrounded by his loving family and friends. And I'm like, that's the way we all want to die. Like, it's like the best death you can have if you're going to die. So I can't say that one. Um, but Livy died way too young. And having, again, it's the, it's the difficulty of those who are grieving. You know, I don't know how much Julian would feel it, nothing mattered more to him really than Emma and his family. And he felt that it was his job in life to protect his brothers and sisters. And so for him, this was the worst thing that could possibly ever happen. And he spent the first two books trying to make sure that those things, that nothing ever happened to his younger brothers and sisters. And I think that it was a shock, not just to me and you know, not just to the readers, but to him, you know, that something this awful happened while he was standing right there and there was nothing he could do about it. It was very sad to write. Yeah. Um, okay, so many, I'm having a hard time choosing the questions. They're all really fascinating and good. Um, uh, let's see. Mm, okay, let's, let's take this one from Rachel Schreier. Hi, Cassie. You've mentioned that Swordcatcher is inspired by Jewish myth and folklore. And looking at that, in, looking at the info that you shared so far, I also noticed some resemblance to Jewish history and some Hebrew sounding names. Is there anything else you can share about your Jewish heritage that influences the world of Swordcatcher? I'm also Jewish and I'm really excited to see you come, see that come up in your work again. Yeah, it's one of the things that's really interesting, I think, um, about being a Jewish writer or creator is that, you know, there are a lot of us, a lot of Jewish writers and creators, but we very rarely tell our own stories. We usually write about other people. You know, we usually write, I mean, uh, you know, there have been famous Jewish writers in movies and liter literature for a long, long time. And, and writing in main, the mainstream format, we're almost always writing about you know, white Christian people, because that's where we feel the, that's how we can be appealing. That's how we can, you know, tell us a story that people will want to read and, you know, not be told that's too Jewish. People aren't going to understand it. Um, and so with this, I wanted to write something that I would have resonated with when I was younger. You know, there are, I think, 
Um, I mean, I'm Jewish, both sides. Mother's Jewish, father's Jewish. Um, I think if I did one of those DNA tests, it would come back and just be like, you're Jewish. <laughs> you're really, really Jewish. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, so and I grew up with my, you know, as I think a lot of us did with my grandma and grandpa and even my great grandparents telling me stories about the books and Jewish folklore, magic superstition, you know, learning, you know, things in Yiddish, but we get these things, also get these things piecemeal, you know, like what Yiddish can I speak? I can talk about food. I can talk about, you know, I can insult people. I can say like, you know, like complimentary words, you know, um, and I was just thinking like, okay, so, you know, not absolutely, but we are a diasporic people. We are scattered all over. What story can I tell in the, this context, you know, of fantasy about this group of people who also are diasporic, who are scattered and within when they, and they live in this city, and this is going to sound familiar because obviously this is, you know, taken from history, they live within walls, they're in what is called the salt. Um, and it, you know, is much like the Jewish ghetto in Venice that was the first ghetto, you know, they can come and go only during the day. They must remain in at night. They must wear certain clothing that marks out who they are. Um, and they also, you know, and they have their own religion that marks them out as different from the mainstream religion of the city of Castellane. And, you know, so I wanted to kind of write about what what that experience is like, what it is like to feel separate and different, what it is like to, um, they also, they, they, you know, they, they, they must answer the question of, you know, what, what I think has to, you know, be asked in that situation, which is do these walls exist to protect us by keeping them out or do they exist as a prison that keeps us in? How do we want to think about that? And so I think there are just a lot of sort of questions that, you know, my ancestors, you know, medieval and, you know, European Jews had to sort of think about and ask. And, um, oh, and also Lynn is a doctor, she's a physician and then for a long, long time, Jews were among the best physicians that were available. Partly they had, you know, special, you know, knowledge. Um, and also they washed their hands. We have a hand washing prayer that goes with the washing of hands and, other doctors didn't, and hand, and so their patients tended to live when other patients tended to die, <laughs> and that really was it. But everyone was like, "Okay, it's magic. The Jews have special healing magic. They are the best doctors." And so I was like, "Okay, so Lynn is a doctor, and she does actually have literal special healing magic. How does that work?" Because I believe like that fantasy is meant to, to um, take you know that which is you know allegorical or apocryphal and make it reality. So. I realize I've talked a long time about this, so I will shut up, but I feel like if you are a, if you are Jewish, there will be things in the book that you recognize and resonate with you, like the word Shulamat, you know, um, which is not a real word, but sounds like one. And um, I think that if you aren't Jewish, I'm hoping that it will still, you know, be interesting and fascinating to you as a modality of magic. Mm -hmm. I think that we should end with that wonderfully rich answer since we are about out of time. Um, so sorry to um, to all those whose questions weren't able to be answered. I did notice many people were asking whether they needed tissues on hand for reading Chain of Thorns, which I don't think you can answer anyway. So I'm not gonna I mean, with you. I guess it depends how you feel about some of the characters. <laughs> you may be sad, maybe not. The, yeah, you know, there could be tears of joy. Can also, you, there you know, could be tears of joy. We we do we, we we cannot say. I think there are some. There are definitely some parts in the book where I was very sad. So you know, take that as you will. But I do think that the ending is is not. It is not the ending of um, the extremely uh, sort of. Now we must all reckon with our own mortality. Ending of Clockwork Princess. This one is a bit more sort of open. There's a lot of questions that we don't have the answer to, but it's more like you know, there is this open future and now we face it and because you can never, you cannot step in the same river twice. So it's always going to be different. Thank you so much, Cassie. Thank you all um, for coming, for uh, being readers. And Cassie, we are so grateful for all the words you give us um, so beautifully. Thank you. Thank you, Maureen. Thanks for being a wonderful moderator as always. 
And um, yeah, thank you guys so much for coming. Uh, Chain of Thorns is out in four hours and I hope you all love it as much as I did. Bye. Bye. Bye.